Lecture 3, Integrating Spirituality and Morality. Let us begin with a reading from Thomas Akempis's The Imitation of Christ. When Jesus is with us, all is right with the world, and nothing seems difficult. When he is missing, everything is hard. When Jesus does not speak to our heart, comfort is worthless. But if he speaks only one word, we feel great joy. In addition to the various relationships involved in spiritual direction, it's also important for us to have a good sense of its transformative effect that it has on the human condition. By integrating spirituality and morality in the life of believers, this is an ongoing challenge. And one way of undertaking this relationship is by looking at how these two important theological moorings of spirituality and morality converge in the spiritual direction process. A critical examination of these dimensions reveals a reciprocal relationship between spiritual and moral knowledge. There is, in other words, a spiritual side to all moral knowledge and a corresponding moral side to all genuine spiritual knowledge. And in spiritual direction, the transformative effects are manifest on all of dimensions of human existence. So let us look at human existence. What is our human makeup, our anthropological consistency? And it shows that we are physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and social beings. And it because it involves people becoming themselves in their faith, spiritual direction must take account of all of these dimensions in human existence. A brief look at the history of theology shows that there are many understandings of human existence that have influenced the formation of Christian doctrine. Christianity, influenced by the Platonic tradition, for example, has emphasized the otherworldly dimensions of human existence. Christianity, influenced by the Aristotelian tradition, emphasizes both the otherworldly and the here and now. Christianity, influenced by the human tradi humanist tradition, focuses on the present circumstances shaping our experience. In his book, Christ and Culture, written in the early 50s, H. Richard Niebuhr talks about various ways in which Christianity is understood as relating to human culture. Christianity can be perceived as against culture, it can be perceived as a product of culture, as above culture, as existing in tension in paradise with culture, and also as having the power to transform it. Any one of these anthropologies and cultural models may have a particular predominance in a particular historical epoch. And at every given time, we may find ourselves influenced by one or more of these models existing intention for a deeper awareness in our present understanding. N. Maxwell Dye said in his book, The Theologian and His Universe, that every mature theological reflection must take into account the concept of God, the concept of humanity, and the concept of the world. This relational triangle of God, humanity, and the world highlights the close connectionship between theology, anthropology, and human culture. And so it brings us to ask ourselves, in the process of spiritual direction, such questions as, what is your ultimate concern in life? What is your primary image of God? What is your understanding of the human person? How do you view the world? 
How do God, humanity, and the world interact? How do they relate? And although we can never answer such questions for those who come to us, we as directors can do a great deal to create a safe and welcoming atmosphere in which they can feel free to share their deepest feelings without fear of judgment. And because such images and attitudes are not formed in isolation, as if in a vacuum, but in a wider context of familial and societal relationships, those seeking guidance must take into account the culture in which they live. By doing so, they will be better able to understand the dynamics of their own way of relating to, and as a result, be in a better position to do something about those areas that are in some way lacking in their lives. As a manual, God with us, Jesus is present to those seeking guidance on every level of their human makeup and promises to lead each person along the way in sound relational wholeness. The incarnational interpretation of spiritual direction should give everyone concerned a deep reverence for their, the interdisciplinary nature of the process of direction itself. And so taking into account every aspect of human existence becomes very, very important in the spiritual direction process. We need to be able to listen attentively to the needs that are expressed on the level of the physical, the emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and social dimensions of the human person. That is very, very important because each one of these dimensions is called to be transformed in God through Christ. Now there is another interesting element that comes to play here, and that is to do with our covenant with God. The transformation of the human person is possible through Christ because God has made a covenant with his people. It's interesting how the notion of covenant was basically an alliance which took shape in ancient times between an overlord and a vassal. And it is in the Judeo tradition alone that we find that this notion of covenant was expressed not merely on a human level, but was expressed for the first time ever in the relationship between the divinity and humanity. And this is notion of a covenantal relationship which took place in ancient Israel, reached its culmination for Christians in the person of Jesus Christ and the spilling of his blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Spiritual direction focuses on this covenantal relationship between the person seeking guidance and God. This experience is intimately related to the ongoing narrative of a person's life. And in spiritual direction, this narrative is unfolded through a threefold movement of narrative sharing, reflective consideration, and transnarrative correspondence. That means that the individual is invited to open up their lives and to share what is going on in their lives. Narrative sharing. Moving then to a moment of reflective consideration where the director invites the directee to reflect upon his or her story, his or her narrative, to underline those salient points that are most significant. And then, after this reflective consideration, to look at the transnarrative correspondence between the individual's life and the life of the gospel narrative. Specifically, Jesus's incarnational entrance into our world, his passion, death, suffering and death, his resurrection to new life, and his nourishing us with the Eucharist. And so questions arise. How do you pray? What do you tell God? What do you share with him? What do you ask of him? What difficulties do you encounter in prayer? Which form of prayer do you like best? Which do you dislike? Which form is God calling you to try? Like 
human actions, human relationships are moral to the extent that they involve deliberation and will. And the covenantal relationship involved in spiritual direction is meant to highlight the individual's relationship with God, his covenantal relationship with God, which ultimately results in friendship with God. It is interesting that in the early centuries of the church, the saints were known as the friends of God. We are all called to be friends of God. We are all called to be saints. And the three marks of friendship are benevolence, which means wishing a person well and actively pursuing his or her well-being, reciprocity, which indicates that the relationship is mutual and not one-sided, and mutual indwelling, which points to the bond shared by friends, the sense of carrying one's friends within one's heart. Friendship with God is the ultimate relationship involved in this covenantal bond between God and humanity. Friendship with God, with each individual person, is the goal of the moral life and the ultimate foundation of all holiness. Becoming a friend of God, in other words, involves not only growing in holiness, but also sharing a deeper participation in the good. So this all comes about in our transformation in God. As I've said previously, St. Athanasius of Alexandria says that God became human so that human humanity might become divine. Such intimacy comes about through the process of spiritual direction, the goal of which is a deepening intimacy with the divine. Such intimacy comes about through the gradual transformation of a person's posture through the threefold relational triangle of God, humanity, and the world. Uh, it involves a journey, a spiritual journey, as we'll see in, in later lectures, a spiritual journey which involves a process of purgation, of detachment from the things which are keeping us down, keeping us away from a deepening relationship with God, a process of illumination which involves working on living a life of virtue and seeking to do good and avoid evil, and finally, an experience of union, union with God, which is born in communion and deep friendship with God. Now, for most people, the path of conversion involves covering ground already traveled. It involves a mutual repetition of going through moments of purgation, illumination, and ultimately union. But the closer we come to God, the more these, these cycles of purgation, illumination, and, and union become smaller and smaller, ultimately to the point they re where they reach a single point of our union with God. What is beautiful about the spiritual journey is that it all comes together in the Eucharist. Because in the Eucharist, we have a time when we, as a people and as individuals, we tell God that we are sorry for our sins in the penitential rite. And there is a moment of illumination when in the homily and in the breaking of the word, the priest or deacon breaks the bread of the word in order to nourish the people who are participating. And then ultimately, in communion, we receive the body and blood of Christ, where that covenant with Christ, born from the spilling of his blood and the breaking of his body, enables us to enter into friendship with God. So to conclude, there are many models of spiritual direction, and no one wishes to place a balanced uh, variety of approaches with a monolithic systematization that would rob the ministry of one of its greatest riches. At the same time, an unwarranted proliferation of models also produces the contrary effect. However, a deepening consciousness of the human, covenantal, and transformational dimensions of direction is meant to provide a solid basis for growth in the moral and spiritual life one directors can refer to with confidence and without hesitation. And it is also meant to be flexible enough 
to allow them to adapt its insights to their own practical preferences regarding the approach and implementation of their ministry. Reflection questions. Do you think it is common for people today to manifest a split between their moral and spiritual lives? Is this split the same in everyone or is there a range of distances? How is it that a person can separate action in the world from one's journey to God? How intrinsic is the link between moral action and a, a person's spiritual well-being? How is it that life in the spirit can be viewed as separate from one's daily decisions?